Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Middle Lothian Council meeting. Uh, before we go to, to business, could I ask that we have a, a moment's contemplation for uh, two unfortunate deaths, one for one that most people know, um, Craig Finlay, the reporter from The Advertiser, and one that probably the, the Labour members will more likely know, the, the ex-mayor of Jarnac, uh, Maurice Bozan. Uh, who died last week. I have sent a letter of condolence to uh, the new Mayor of Jarnac uh, on the Council's behalf. So if we just have a moment's contemplation for the, the two people. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any apologies? Apologies, Provost, from uh, Councillor Montgomery. The order of business is as printed in the agenda, Provost. Okay. If there are any declarations, uh, you can either make them now or when the, the, meeting, the item comes up on the agenda. Thank you. Um, Move item four, the minutes of the the meeting of the twenty third of June uh, for approval. Okay. Item five, there are no questions to the leader of the council. I move to item six A and a motion by Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Russell. Thank you, Provost. Um, so the, the context of this is, um, is an extremely sad one in that, as uh, colleagues will have seen reported, there, there was a, a sexual offence that took place in the Lauder Road area, uh, which, if we remember, is the, the sort of second uh, reported offence uh, that, that we will remember seeing of that, that nature. Uh, since then, uh, since that terrible incident there has been a lot of work done uh, I'd like to thank uh, officers here and, and also the police for steps that they've taken to improve safety uh, that particular area in terms of lines of sight and cutting back of uh, vegetation which was making it a very dark and intimidating uh, place uh, so that work I think and many people in the community have said uh, has been very welcome however uh, after that work uh, was completed which I think was the the right priority. There is now a kind of voice from um, within many members of the community that CCTV is something that we uh, might look at. I think the right thing uh, to do uh, at this stage is to, to call for this report uh, to come before us at the next council and at that point take a view um, based on uh, the best advice contained within that report, uh, whether CCTV is something that, that would help improve uh, safety at that site given the most unfortunate uh, history there um, and given that at this point we're just asking for a report to come forward I'd be grateful for uh, support from across the chamber. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Thank you Provost. I wish to second this, uh, this motion uh, as, as my colleague has, has already alluded to there's a lot of work has been done in this area and uh, the people on, on both sides or the road um, are happy with it, but they are, uh, I suppose, more of peace of mind, not just for uh, women on their own, but for, for children. I'm sure the CCTV camera would be a welcome addition if that was possible. Thank you. Councillor Constable. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, I have a, an amendment motion I'd like to have circulated just now. <coughs> Substantially agreeing uh, with the original motion uh, with just uh, uh, changes which I'll explain as they come round. <clears throat> In it you'll see I've asked for the councillor request office to bring forward a report to a future council meeting. Uh, do, I wouldn't like it affixed to the next council meeting because I'd like to be considered, fully considered, a future council meeting concerning the implications of installing CCTV cameras at Lauder Road 
and also to consider the possible identification of other suitable sites across the county and also any resource implications to be considered as part of the council budget in this year and in subsequent years. As, as you see, it's very much the same motion and we, I would hope that that could be supported by both sides of this house. Uh, Councillor Johnson. I support Councillor uh, Constable's uh, counter motion. Okay, we have uh, two motions uh, before us. Uh, those in favour of, or do, you, do you wish to speak on your, do you, do you wish to accept the, the counter motion? Thank you, Provost. N no, I don't. Do you, want, do you want me to speak explaining why? Okay. Okay. Uh, look, I, I sort of appreciate the, the points that have been made, but I, f I feel that there's probably two reasons why people in the community wouldn't, wouldn't be happy with this. The, the first is um, it feels like it's being put off. You know, I think probably the time between now and the next council meeting would be would be sufficient for officers to pull together a, a reasonable uh, considered report. Certainly my experience has been in the past that there would be no obvious problem with doing so. Um, and I also think that whilst it is a reasonable point, that in general, yep, I would be broadly happy that CCTV be looked at across the county. I sort of feel that this is a very specific, very unfortunate um, set of circumstances in one particular location that probably bears being treated uh, with a, a bit of exceptional uh, exceptionality. And so, you know, the specific thing that I'm looking for really, which is a report seeing whether CCTV could help in this area where there is a really clear identifiable problem. It doesn't feel like I'm going to get that with, uh, with the counter motion, so I would reject it. Councillor Rosie. Thanks, Provost. Um, just a point uh, there, and I think Councillor Russell uh, alluded to it, uh, there is the fact that the Council, in conjunction with the police, have done a considerable amount of work in this area. Um, clearing bushes, trees, and everything, making it a lot more. And in fact, I think it, we should maybe allow some time there also and see how that progresses and how the public there perceive uh, the, the situation in that area. So I would say that in itself gives us more time to con make a considered judgment. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I share at least one concern with uh, the comments that Councillor Young mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, there is a danger that this is going to be kicked into the long grass, and I would like to see at least a commitment that this is brought forward to Council by the end of this year, because otherwise it may drag on and be forgotten about. Um, on the actual specifics, I, I would like to see a wider remit, but at the same time I can also see why there's uh, a, a need to specifically look at the issues relating to Lauder Road because that has been known in the past to be a hot spot, if you like, and that must be worrying to many people throughout Midlothian. Councillor Constable. I'm uh, happy to agree to uh, the amending the amendment to a future council meeting uh, in 2014, 2015. <laughs> uh, so it would be uh, dealt with this year. Sorry, could you repeat that? I'd be happy to have to do a future council meeting in 2015, in other words, later on in the year. I'd be happy to see okay. that. But I feel just to rush it to uh, the next meeting would just be perhaps a bit precipitate. Okay, thank you. Right, we have uh, two motions before us. We have a motion from Councillor Young. Those in favour, please show. And a motion from Councillor Constable. Those in favour, please show. The motion from Councillor Constable is carried. Thank you. Item 6B, uh, a motion from Councillor Milligan, seconded by... Councillor Margot Russell. Thanks, Provost. Provost, the, the, the motion is self-explanatory. Um, it has been raised in your communities quite a few times as to why um, the likes of East Lothian Council and neighbouring authorities are, are, are given free swimming and what are the alternatives that Midlothian are, 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 are given. Uh, indeed, 
Uh, um, there's been much talk at all about the, the use of the facilities and leisure facilities and that over the summer with the, 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 the real good Scottish weather that we've been having this year and ways we can better attract people um, into the, to, to, to the facilities, the excellent facilities that we have. Um, I think it's quite clear if you take, for example, um, the suggestion that I went to some years ago to Gary with, with the teen zone card, which seems to be, have been a great success, and getting youngsters in, it's also attracting their parents and, and, and other users into the, the centres. So I would ask the, the, the Council to agree that the first part of the motion that we give um, consideration to free swimming up to the ages of 18. I've looked at various um, councils and, and, and the vary in the times that youngsters are allowed, it varies in the ages that they're allowed, and I have asked that we consider up to the age of 18 years uh, as, as a starting point. Maybe the report will come back recommending Sahan, something else. I am very much aware for, for contacting other councils that Edinburgh Council are going to review their decision because they have not seen a massive increase and, and, and the uptake uh, and the numbers going there, and it might just be that, 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 that that's what comes back. However, I would urge us to at least have a look at it. It's also very clear, and I'm, I'm sorry Gary's not here today, but uh, on numerous occasions I've went around last week to high school with Gary over the summer holidays, and the place is lying empty in the leisure side. It's no heavily used at all, and I would like to see what, what actions we're going to take to try and encourage the use of these fantastic facilities over the summer period and see what we can do to get people into them and I would hope that we would accept this motion. Councillor Russell. Thank you, Provost. Uh, happy to, to support this motion. Uh, I know that the, the education division of this local authority does work with certain groups and does give uh, free swimming lessons to some children, not all children. But, so I think this would address quite a lot of the issues that we have. You know, we're keeping kids off the streets, giving them something to do, but also being healthy in that as well for them. So happy to second. Thank you. Councillor Rosie. Thanks, Provost. Um, uh, I'm not in sort of total disagreement to the, to the motion that's been put forward, but can I ask that a counter motion be put forward <laughs> on behalf of the administration? Thanks. Councillor Rosie. Right, thanks very much. Um, as you see, the counter motion reads um, Council requests that officers uh, bring forward a report to look at how we can enhance and encourage more and better use of all our leisure facilities during the Midlothian school uh, holiday periods. Uh, this report will set out the policies of other school councils, other Scottish councils, sorry, regarding children's leisure activities during school holidays, and um, provide details of the activities that are presently available at council leisure facilities uh, during school holidays and consider consideration uh, to be included in the 1617 revenue budget process um, and do so i think this would give us a more informed uh, information in which to make a decision on this one um, and i think it's a bit wider than the, the swimming uh, but um, that's the counter motion Councillor Milligan, do you wish to say anything on your motion? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually struggling to see, apart from the, 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 the free swimming ones, what the difference is in these. This just seems like we're, we're actually going to play politics with every motion, and it effectively blows smoke as to where the new council leader talked about working together and trying to do joint stuff together. Our motions have been on the table, quite frankly, for over a week, and we've had no communication at all. And really noticeable that, that we're simply playing politics here with, with, with our kids. It's a wee bit just shameful, to be frank. Councillor Devink. Well, this second motion, I think, is a much more thoughtful motion because it does not take into account 
the necessity of the coming by-election, and this has got much more feasibility as far as thought and the expenses with regards to the budget is concerned. Right, thank you. Um, and wish to add to the motions. Okay, we have the two motions, one from Councillor Milligan. Those in favour, please show. And a motion from Councillor Rosie, please show. Thank you, Councillor Rosie's motion is passed. Item 6C, a motion from Councillor Muirhead, seconded by Councillor Young. Thanks, Provost. Um, look forward to seeing what amendment there's got to be to this one. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, the officers for organising the seminar um, that we had uh, a wee while ago on the, the issue of the energy that we're highlighting here today. I think it certainly stimulated a lot of discussion, certainly within this group, um, on the issues that were raised. Um, certainly made us uh, think, and that's why we're bringing forward this motion here today. Absolutely nothing to do with the um, by-election uh, that's, that's got to take place. Um, we think that it is important that Midlothian play a part in uh, reducing um, Scotland and the UK's carbon footprint. For statutory reasons, we're obliged to, but also for moral reasons um, uh, and practical reasons. Um, we um, note the situation that we're in in terms of um, you know, the, the, the difficulties that we have with our revenue budget and um, our obligations that we have to uh, people in Midlothian to try and maintain services um, as, as high a level as, as possible. Yeah, this is not about... Um, getting money for the council's coffers, it's about protecting uh, services. Quite often, especially when we're talking about technologies that are changing and moving all the time, it's quite difficult for organisations such as local authorities to you know, take that step. Uh, and, and, I, and I recognise um, the, the, um, the good work that's been done in some of the other local authorities who've been prepared to get in at the sharp end of the early, early stages and, and lead the field. Um, it is often the case that leaders can become winners, though, and I think that that's the, the, the kind of approach that we need to take uh, here. Um, we don't think that there is time to waste, so I hope that the administration isn't going to kick this into the, the long grass, as they have uh, uh, with previous uh, motions here. Um, we are in a situation, obviously, climate change is the most important issue, but we, we, we have an opportunity here, I think, to help deal with our uh, budget situation as well. Um, so what the motion is calling for is the setting up of uh, an energy services company. We indicate wholly owned by the council. We're not averse to, you know, as I say, there are examples of other um, uh, authorities doing things slightly differently. And the report coming back to the council, you know, we'd be quite happy if it did touch on other uh, methods of delivery, providing that it, it met the aims. Um, uh, we're, we're looking to... Um, do a whole host of things. We're talking about uh, location, design, build, operate, renewable energy facilities to meet the aims that we, we are putting forward here today, and that includes things like the potential of uh, harnessing the power from uh, rivers at a local level, um, and as, as well as um, the heat exchange and any other schemes that, that are available, uh, and using our, um, our buildings that we're, we're currently um, uh, about to uh, procure um, to house some of that to, uh, energy generation. The main, obviously the main purpose has to be about protecting the environment, reducing emissions, but that secondary aim, I think, about saving us money in terms of our energy consumption and also um, the potential of raising money in the current climate is something that we should really focus on so we don't want to be diverted too much away from the benefits arising from this coming back to the council. No, because, no as I say, just to fill our, our coffers, but to maintain the level of service that people that we represent need. So I move, Provost. Thanks. 
Thank you. Councillor Young. Thanks, Provost. Um, yeah, just as Councillor, sorry, as Councillor Muir had said, um, this is an idea that, that's kind of born out of some degree of necessity in terms of uh, the sharpening of focus on tackling climate change uh, and also the necessity of generating new sources of income uh, against falling budgets. But having said that, I think it's also quite an exciting thing to be involved in. I think looking at what other local authorities have done is something that we should be kind of enthusiastic about rather than feel that it's something that we've kind of got to kind of plod along with. Um, I guess part of that um, excitement in moving forward is just thinking, well, the more time that's delayed is the more time wasted. Um, and when we think about what that means, uh, Councillor Muir had touched on it, it's potentially a significant uh, source of uh, additional income to help us provide a good level of services to people in, in Midlothian, which is what we, we're trying to, to do. For example, if you look at what other forward-thinking local authorities uh, have done uh, from the presentation that, that came to us, I think, at the end of June, you know, there's a, uh, the Radar Weir uh, in uh, Wales, I believe. They've got a hydro scheme on a, on a river that's netting them £5 million over 20 years. So when you begin to think about those figures, it is significant. And the kind of holistic <coughs> approach to it is as energy production gets more renewable and moves away from big power stations, why not have it the case that organisations like ours and local authorities are there generating that money, taking the lead and using the, the proceeds to deliver excellent services. So I think, it's a, I think it's a big idea. I think it's obviously a big undertaking. I think it's something that we need to get a, a move on with. But I think it's exciting. I think it's something that we should all broadly uh, try and get behind. Thank you. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Provost. I, I very much welcome this, uh, this motion from the Labour Group. It's uh, exactly the kind of thing I've been pushing for for some time, particularly through the Business Transformation Steering Group. Uh, we've joined now APSI Energy, which gives us advice, uh, which is uh, you know, what we need at this stage, because we're uh, early days yet. Um, just one or two comments, uh, just to that uh, my colleagues are aware, if they were not already aware, there was a hydro conference uh, organised by Midlothian Federation of Community Councils, which was very successful in the autumn. So there is movement within the communities here, which is also supportive, and I think it's great if we can, we can uh, help with that. Um, one other thing which uh, I'm quite keen on is publicly owned um, wind, wind turbines as well, not just solar, not just hydro. Uh, but wind turbines. I know there is uh, a lot of opposition amongst communities because of the visual impact, and yet uh, where surveys have been carried out across the world, they find that if those renewables are publicly owned for the, for the public good, for community good, that uh, opposition disappears. And I would like to highlight as well a report uh, in December 2014, of, which said that of 740 industrial estates in Scotland, the, 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 the best one, the windiest one in the whole of Scotland is Mayfield Industrial Estate. That's right in the heart of a community that really needs the, 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 the financial resources which come from, uh, from, from uh, investments like this, and also in the heart of an industrial estate which can use that energy. So please, uh, let, let's not uh, forget that. Um, we're talking about the models, the different models that can be used, and Councillor Muir has absolutely right. There are, there's, the, there's no one size fits all for lots of different ones. There's quite a useful uh, model which I'm quite interested in, which Peterborough Council are using just now, and that involves a not for profit which uses a feed in tariff. To, um, to run the scheme and to pay something towards the community and something towards the, the, the council. But the thing I really like about it is that it goes on the, uh, the household roofs and all the surplus energy, uh, which it's, it, the electricity it generates, if you like, goes free to the householder. Now that is a way of cutting fuel poverty, which I think that we should really be doing amongst our, our, our council estate. If we can put solar panels on as many council houses as we can, we would go a long way towards uh, reducing, if not eradicating, fuel poverty in Midlothian. So that's something which I'm, I'm really keen on. Finally, one word of warning. Unfortunately, this uh, government, which uh, the UK uh, electorate decided to put into Westminster uh, not so long ago, has seen in its uh, wisdom 
to cut the green crap, as David Cameron said, and to uh, remove many of the subsidies, particularly for, for uh, investments of over five megawatts uh, in, in energy. So larger scale wind turbine, uh, wind farms, larger scale solar farms may now become uneconomic, and that is deplorable, considering the huge, huge amount of uh, subsidy which goes into fossil fuels and has gone into fossil fuels, much of it hidden for many, many years. So I would like to fully support the motion which has been presented today. And let's not forget Hinkley Point, the nuclear power station that they're so anxious to invest heavily in. Councillor Rosie. Thanks, Provost. Um, well, I'm just about to shock uh, Councillor Mulligan in your head <laughs> and uh, say that uh, I support the motion. Um, <laughs> don't all cheer. Um, no, uh, uh, just a few points to make um, that, that following on from the, the energy briefing that was presented to the Council on 30th of June, um, officers are in the process of preparing for the reports um, in response to the views expressed at that briefing and um, officers have been requested to bring forward a paper with a proposed energy policy for consideration by, of members and uh, proposals uh, funding uh, to undertake a feasibility, full feasibility uh, assessment on the, the, and the initial viability of an ESCO and early projects. So, and I think the Council should also note that the issue of energy uh, forms part of the Council's transformation programme. So, yeah, I'm happy to present uh, to support the motion. Anybody else? Councillor De Vink. Yeah. When I read this motion, I thought to myself, aren't we doing almost everything what's here being suggested? And I feel that maybe Labour is trying to look for a role for themselves as they are so woefully short of other ideas. And I'm, you know, they are just stating what is all so obvious. But I would like to take issue on the wind issue that my dear friend Ian Baxter has suggested. Wind is not the solution. Solar and tidal, by all means, but winds is woefully ineffective. 22% um, economic benefit is not sufficient, and I totally disagree with what he had to say. Councillor Constable. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, like Councillor Baxter, I've been in my travels too. I'm just back from the county, which is perhaps the capital of renewable in Scotland, Orkney. And, of course, we've got a lot of wind there, and uh, most... A lot of the farms now have their own little turbines, uh, but I must agree with uh, Ian about the principle of a community turbine. The next island, Bury, has a big turbine, which looked on very differently for the, all the benefit of that goes into the community. Same in the next island across, further across Florida, they have, a lot of the islands have community turbines and it makes a big difference uh, to the attitude of it. Uh, they, of course, have the tidal power coming on stream uh, one thing I did notice was that in the, the village that we were nearest, uh, the three electric cars, uh, electric cars, I know we've uh, changed as leader the official car to an electric car, I'm sure you like that promise, uh, but the, uh, there are a lot of electric cars there on an archipelago of the uh, size of Orkney, 90 miles is a big range, you can't go much further without getting wet, so uh, it's good to see them getting there, uh, taking part in that as well. So, yes, I'm very much in agreement with this motion. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Prof. I'd just like to come back in on the, uh, the arguments against uh, wind generation. Um, renewables, in gen renewables in general, particularly wind, actually have recently been found to be up to three times more valuable than originally estimated in terms of pounds and pence, largely because of factors such as uh, they tend to be nearer to where the energy is going to be used, whereas power stations are concentrated and have a large trans, uh, transmission uh, of electricity across distances, which, which reduces the amount of, uh, of energy which is actually usable. But there are also other factors as well. Energy costs are going to go up in the longer term. There may be a short-term blip at the moment, but in the longer term they will go up. Storage, that is the next big revolution in, in, in uh, renewables. And you have to remember that one problem with wind at the moment is the storage. 
And if we can get over the storage uh, issue, which could be large-scale uh, storage of water in hydro schemes, or it could be uh, producing uh, electrolysis to produce hydrogen and oxygen, or it could be by transmission or storage into batteries. But that is the next generation. Once that comes about, once cheap storage is available, we'll find that renewables are far more economic than they seem to be at the moment. And uh, I think we have to look to the long term rather than looking at how much it costs to generate each particular kind of, um, to, to use each kind of fuel at the moment. Councillor Muirhead. Yeah, Provost, I did consider responding to Councillor uh, DeVink's comments, but he's, he's such an expert in generating wind, I thought I'd better uh, no bother. Um, and can I just say to Councillor Baxter that, um, you know, the only reason it, Mayfield's got the windiest industrial estate in Scotland is because there's no industrial estate in Gorbrig. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd urge uh, the unanimous um, uh, support of the, of the motion here today, um, which is, 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 is done despite what was said for all the right reasons, because we think this is the right way to go. Thank you. I don't think there's any dissenting voices from that motion. Okay, so it's carried. Thank you. Item number seven, the appointment of the Church of Scotland representative <coughs> in education matters. A report by Mr Blair. Thanks, Provis. This report proposes a change to the Church of Scotland representative who regularly attends the Council and Cabinet meetings. The detail and legislative requirements are set out in the main text of the report, and today Council is invited to consider the recommendations as listed on page 71 of your papers. Thanks, Provis. Councillor Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's sad that um, Mr Hayes has decided to leave, but we welcome um, Ruth Halley as one of our own um, into the Council and hope she enjoys her time here and uh, propose we recommend, uh, accept his recommendations. Thank you. Anybody otherwise minded? No. Mr Bourne. I think it's appropriate for one of the other church threats, and I'm sure Margaret would echo this, to record our thanks to Paul. I think one thing we all valued about Paul was he, he usually th his thinking was out of the box quite often. I'm not sure I always understood, but I usually I saw where he was going eventually. He did introduce some quite exciting educational ideas to our debate. Um, I have already made contact, I hope you don't mind, on the assumption that you, you would be uh, approving today with Ruth and invited her next week to have a wee informal chat over coffee and Margaret's able to join me. I've just got one question uh, in terms of the, the legalities and the technicalities. Will she actually be invited to the next Cabinet meeting? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, we accept that recommendation. Thank you. Item number eight, Audit Committee Chair's Annual Report. A report by Mr Blair. Thanks, Provis. This report has been referred to Council from the Audit Committee, and I'm pleased to say we've got the Chair of the Audit Committee, Mr Smale, in attendance today. And the recommendations are inviting the Council to consider the annual report by the independent Chair. Councillor Brent. Thank you, Provis. I want to thank Peter Smale for an excellent report, and I would only comment on a couple of minor items on page 75 under meetings, just to remind the Chamber that the meetings have been, been uh, downgraded from 7 to 5, and I have to comment again about the independent voluntary member, and wonder where we are with that. Mr Smale, do you have to comment? Uh, I think the Chief Executive may know the position on the additional independent member as this is a council appointment, not an audit committee appointment. There has been uh, an application received um, and uh, an interview is taking place um, later this month. So hopefully um, by September, um, by the time of the September audit uh, meeting, we will have uh, the um, additional independent member. Many thanks. 
Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that report, Mr. Smeal. Item number nine, developing Midlothian young workforce and positive destinations, a report by Mrs. Smith. Thank you, Provost. <clears throat> the purpose of this report is to outline the progress uh, Midlothian Council and its partners have made in relation to the recommendations contained within the Developing Scotland Young Workforce, which previous, previously was known as the Wood Commission. Um, it provides a summary of the action planned to support young people in Midlothian. Um, section 2 outlines the progress Midlothian has made to date. Uh, and whilst we had 93.9% of our young people in positive destinations at, uh, in October 2014, the follow-up in March showed a drop of 4.2%. Uh, this equated to 87% of our young people who were not in a positive destination. Our research indicated that whilst 32, um, our research indicated that uh, of the 87 young people, 32 had dropped out of a college uh, or a training course and the report outlines what we're doing in relation to these issues. Section 2 outlines the actions that Midlothian is taking against the recommendations of the Developing Scotland's uh, workforce. Um, and Section 2.3.1 outlines our progress since January of this year. Um, and uh, Section 4 has the recommendations. Um, just for the Council to note the focus uh, of the attention for prioritised work for the developing Scotland's young workforce, which is not easy to say. Uh, note the year-on-year -year progress made in supporting young people to achieve positive destinations and support the renewed efforts required to increase these um, and endorse the actions contained in Appendix 1 in respect of the key areas for development. And I'm happy to take any questions and my colleague Grace is here to assist. Thank you. Councillor Consul. Uh, thank you. Yes, I want to thank Mary for this report. It's a very detailed report, uh, <coughs> indicating all the, the progress that we're making on these issues. We have done very well. Uh, there are seasonable uh, adjustments uh, that do occur in the figures. Uh, one thing I do want to draw attention to is, uh, on page 106, the report recommends a focus on the STEM subjects. This is something where uh, UK, in general, uh, all over, uh, lags behind on the science, technology, engineering and maths, the STEM subjects which will be the vital to creating uh, future wealth of the whole community. Uh, I understand my colleague, might, uh, Deputy Provost, has more experience in some of these matters and will be talking. Can you your head? Yeah, um, I, I congratulate officers on, on, uh, and, and uh, everybody involved and, and you know, the, the basis of this report here, the, the very good uh, progress has been made uh, in terms of positive destinations. Uh, absolutely taking nothing away from that. I, I do want to highlight something that is sort of with our control, though, uh, that is, 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 a, is a negative, and that's on page uh, 98. Um, Mary touched on it. 16 young people withdrawn from for, uh, further education during the year, uh, citing um, a number of reasons. In discussions with officers, I understand that 60% of those um, youngsters who have withdrawn from further education have done so, citing uh, transport, uh, travel um, issues and finance. Um, so, so, you know, it's something that we certainly raise concerns about um, the uh, situation at uh, the um, Edinburgh College uh, our campus here in Midlothian. Um, when um, a, a number of courses were moved in, into the other end of, of Edinburgh. And my concern here is that situation, and I know it's a concern of officers as well, that that situation is only going to get worse given the withdrawal of the subsidised transport uh, between the college and um, uh, the, the locations uh, in the city that, that have until now uh, been available to the youngsters that can only get worse, and we can only uh, are likely to see um, others um, uh, potentially withdrawn from that. And I'd like us to actually highlight that uh, to uh, the College of Concerns on that, um, not taking anything away from the fact that otherwise uh, this is a, an excellent report. And the one thing on the back of what um, Councillor Constable mentioned about the STEM industries, 
you know, I think we could probably do a bit more to work closer uh, with the, um, the the Bush estate, uh, given you know that kind of the, 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 the science park, if you like, up there. Um, it's on your doorstep, and I think <coughs> that at the moment, well, and I know officers are, are dealing with this, uh, but at the moment, it's kind of it's been left to some extent to the individual schools to make the kind of relationships uh, <coughs> with the the, um, the 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 industries and the, the education facilities up there. And I think you know taking a more proactive central role and pushing that forward would be something that would be that would that would reap dividends in the longer term, and only help to increase positive destinations. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. In response to the comments made about the transport arrangements from the Edinburgh College site in S Bank to the other campuses, it might both worth, be worth all of us recalling the fact that we did raise this at some length with Edinburgh College when they made their new arrangements to concentrate the best possible resources for all their students in different locations. And they recognised very clearly that for a lot of young people and not so young people who were on these courses, that the additional travel costs would be prohibitive, not to mention the fact that multiple public bus routes would not necessarily serve the students very well. And in response to that, they laid on a free transport link to the other campuses. And while my, I had a recent meeting with the, um, the senior management team at Julianet, uh, sorry, at Edinburgh College, and accordingly, I understand that the cost of running that facility, which has had a very, very poor uptake of use, um, has meant that they've decided to remove that from their budget requirements. What they are doing instead is they are going to be providing a free taxi service on demand for the needs of any, any of their students who will require transport from the local campus to the campuses where those courses are taking place. So I really do have difficulty in accepting Councillor Muirhead's position on this. I'm, I'm not declaring an interest for Edinburgh College. I'm merely saying I think that they have been thoughtful and responsive in this regard. They have a vested interest to make sure that they have the very best possible uptake, both in numbers and quality of students, and make every possible attempt to remove obstacles from that. And I think they've done that very successfully. I think they deserve our praise and commendation, not criticism. I think the fact that up till now, uh, youngsters have been saying that the reason that they're withdrawn from college is that. It's not just about the costs, it's also about the fact that the amount of time it takes to travel away to the other side of the town, it eats into your day. So it's not just that, and the numbers are actually talking for themselves here. There has been a problem in the past. I admit I, didn't, I wasn't aware of the, the taxi service. If that's the case, it'll help a bit, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that youngsters have dropped out, even though there was a bus available. I have to say that I think most of the courses that were taken were building courses. And I think I've said before and here, if apprentices, <laughs> sorry, want to learn the building trade, they're not going to get jobs just outside their houses. They're going to have to travel once they get an apprenticeship. So... Travelling to college should be no problem to them. Yeah. Councillor Bourne. Promoted already, Mr Bourne, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. Um, I must admit I found this a really fascinating paper, and it doesn't hide anything. Everything is really up front. It was a very, very useful paper. And yes, it's, as they say, it's a bit like the curate's eggs, there are pluses and minuses. I tended to focus on the March 14 and the March 15, because I realise statistics do change from the initial gathering to the final gathering. I mean, there's a major positive between the two years on employment, a plus 4% increase. That, that is fantastic, because the ultimate goal of all of this is that the youngsters get jobs. Uh, and of course, the improvement in HE, I mean... Higher education has always been challenging for us in Midlothian. We've all try, always tried in teaching to get the youngsters to be more aspirational, and it's good to see these figures. Slightly less encouraging are the small declines in training, and FE in particular, um, but I do welcome some of the comments that have just been made about transport and also the other support that's mentioned in this paper. I think this is crucial. 
Moving on, perhaps one or two observations, Provost. Um, key to the future, it seems to me, is the relationship between the new and existing SMEs in our area and their relationship with Edinburgh College and our secondary schools. We often hear quoted the, the so-called Mittelstand in Germany and the success of small and medium enterprises, I believe, from my experience and observation in Germany, is because they have this great relationship between these small and medium-sized firms and uh, the technical schools, the technical colleges, the local authority, and we are very good at that in this local authority, and banks and other institutions. Last year, the council facilitated a new partnership between Edinburgh College and the colleges in Christ Heinsberg. I do perhaps hope that when some of our students and lecturers from Edinburgh College do visit, have the opportunity to visit the colleges in Heinsberg, that they perhaps look at this relationship. Because we have many strengths in our FE system, but I do believe the strength in the German system is this key relationship between small and medium-sized firm, which Midlothian is very strong in. There's a very positive statement in this paper about modern apprenticeships. I think many of us in this room realise how important the, the development of apprenticeships are for our future and quality employment. Perhaps slightly diverging, the, the recent employment figures have tended to show a huge growth, I'm talking the national employment figures and of course Scotland, a huge growth in self-employment. Um, while some of this news is not as good as it might sound in that some people are not exactly earning a great deal of money from this self-employment, others are. I wonder how we can encourage our young people, because we hear stories about teenagers building apps in their bedroom and building wee enterprises where they're selling goods, etc. How could we encourage our younger people to become entrepreneurs? You know, do we explain to them things like business plans, crowdfunding relationships with bank? I think this whole area of self-employment in an area like this, our young people are very entrepreneurial, and that's my experience. It's a new generation, this millennium generation. And I've, I suppose I've got a question and an observation just to finish. Um, we've heard much about the, the new, and I, and I don't want to be political here, I'll call it living wage or minimum wage, you can call it what you like, that it's going to rise. But it's not going to rise for youngsters under 25. Do we anticipate this is actually, maybe not in the best possible way, going to have a positive effect on employment of youngsters between the age of 18 and 25? Thank you, Provost. <coughs> Councillor Coventry. Yeah, thanks, Provost. Uh, uh, Mr. Bourne's point, I think that's an excellent point about the, the, the contact between schools, colleges, and, and Midlothian Council and, and local employers. It's a fact that lots of employers, it's a sad fact that lots of employers are, are really unwilling to employ people straight from education. They, they don't believe that they've got the, the necessary skills required. I don't uh, agree with that personally, however, that, that's a fact. Can I, can I move on to the point raised by Councillor Muirhead about the transport? It, no one has mentioned the Borders Rail Link. Borders College will be 20 minutes away from S Bank. You know, so also the other fact is that research shows that most young people drop out of further or higher education because they choose the wrong courses. So it's vitally important that young people do the proper research and find out what it is that appeals to them as individuals. I want to welcome this paper, particularly the, on page 98, the appointment of three additional transition support workers, which will help young people uh, move into and maintain a positive destination. Also, the fact that positive destinations remain a priority for Midlothian Council, this has to be welcomed. As has been mentioned, the, the mention of modern apprenticeships, and incentivising and supporting employers, etc. On the appendix on page 105, I'll just mention one point here, the, the employability part. Now, but we are in the middle of a major transformation of our concepts of work and career. The traditional concept of a career has been concerned with progression up an ordered hierarchy, either in a profession or an organisation. This is now fragmenting due to the advent of new technology and globalisation. Individuals have to take much more responsibility for their own career development on a lifelong basis. So therefore, 
I'm glad to see that, that it's mentioned in the, the appendix that My World at Work, uh, which is, for your information, is a, a really useful tool in, in helping you with your CVs, career research, interview techniques, etc. It's not only, when I read that paper, it looked to me as if it was only for young people. It's for people of all ages. I just want to finish off by saying I've been following the opinion polls quite closely. Now I work in careers, and I just want to you know, offer the members of the Labour Party, looking at the opinion polls, if you're never too old to change career. <laughs> and if you do want a confidential one-to-one -one careers interview, please come and see me. I'll be quite happy to provide that for you. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Young. Um, well, um, yeah, very good. Just, um, just on the just the last bit about um, on Midlothian College because it's it's broadly uh, obviously a really um, successful report. Good to see the um, the proportion of people going into positive destinations going up. And I think maybe a, a byproduct of that is it does probably give council a bit more freedom to to look at the thankfully diminishing areas where there could be a problem and maybe just get it right. Because certainly, you know. Councillor Beatty mentioned there that the discussions with, with the college. You know, I've spoken to the senior leaders at the college as well, and just to pick up on something that the provost said, their view, or certainly the view of the, the vice principal that I spoke with, seemed to make sense, which was, yes, you do need to make sure that you're not sort of teaching young people that there'll always be a, you know, an easy way to get to work or an easy way into, you know, that they will have to travel to undertake work. I think everyone at college that I've spoken to accepts that. But a good point that uh, the teaching leader or the, learn the leaders at the, the college raised with me was once you get them, you need to get them into it. So you need to make it reasonably easy so that the, the learners sort of get hooked onto the, the programme that they're on. And I guess the worry, just that, the, you know, that we, should, we should individually as councillors when it's in our ward or do all we can as a council just to make sure that um, we as a stakeholder of the Midlothian campus are just putting enough positive pressure on leaders there to make sure that when people in our area, young people do want to, or people who want to retrain, want to get these skills, that there is the, the transport there. Certainly the information about the, the taxi wasn't something that I was aware of either, but it's something that I'll be going to get more information on because I'm not sure it does sound like it would be the case that, I can't imagine that at seven o'clock in the morning you're gonna get up and be able to get a taxi straight to Granton. It maybe it's more like if you've got a class there and then after your class they might get, get you down to Granton. Um, but certainly I'll ask for a report on that because I do think it's quite an important point because joinery and construction is a big set of skills and I take the point that yeah, when they're in the world of work or apprenticeships they may have to travel but I do think in the first year or perhaps two years of learning uh, transport is a really big issue. Well, I reiterate uh, what I said before. <laughs> you're in the wrong trade if you're in the building trade and you don't want to travel to go and learn that skill. We all have to do it. I like 16, promised. I had to do it when I was an apprentice, jump on two buses, humping my own tools, by the way. They don't have to do that anymore because they're not doing buses with them. So I think they've got a wee bit easier than I had. But anyway, let's move on and thank... OK, Mrs Smith, you wish to come in. Thank you. It's just to say um, a number of you have raised uh, different issues, but... We have discussed with the college um, some of the issues that young people have spoken to us about. And the difference is we now know where these young people are and what's happened to them. Whereas before, they would drop out of college and it wasn't followed up. We now follow up with them. The college has now agreed to come out and do some of these earlier um, SVQ models in Midlothian. So that gets the connection for young people at 16 who may have made the wrong choice. They may have taken a course because their pal took it and then realise they're on the wrong, uh, the wrong pathway. But the point is, they make that connection here and then the travel to Granton or wherever doesn't seem as bad if you're moving from Pennycook or Gorebridge or, or wherever. So we've already done that. We've already done that work. We've got courses that are set up for September. So the difference, I think, this time is we've got eight to seven young people. We know where they are. They all may not choose to engage with us. However, we are there encouraging them here are things that are going on, and that's the difference. Okay. I'd like to thank the director and our team for uh, that good report. Thank you.
Item number 10, Education Scotland Bill, a report by Mrs Vickers, Head of Education. Okay, I'll, you? I'll <laughs> be Mrs Vickers as <laughs> Mrs. well. Mrs Smith again then. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the purpose of this report is just to provide an overview of the Scottish Government's rationale um, for including the new legislative provisions in the Education Scotland Bill. Um, 2.1 sets out the background and it's about closing the attainment gap. We know there's an attainment gap that widens as our youngsters get older. Um, and the um, Scottish Government is looking to close that attainment gap. Um, they have set out some provisions within the report, and that is to reduce the inequalities and in the outcomes for all, specifically those experiencing social economic disadvantage. That's in section three. Um, so um, there's actions that are taken in there. The, the Scottish Government is looking at a chief education officer um, that would be prescribed by the, the um, had specific roles. Um, the Gaelic medium, um, giving parents uh, the right to request um, Gaelic um, education. And part three is exciting, the miscellaneous modifications of enactments. Um, and that's uh, the, the bill will extend the rights under the Educational Act for all children aged 12 and over with capacity um, to request an assessment. That also fits in with the GERFEC agenda as well. Um, the provision is also for free school meals or provision for school meals in Scotland. And um, the section point 473, uh, the section does not reflect change in policy and addresses the unintentional exclusions of a small group of children from early learning and childcare provision. So, as you can see, it's a, a quite wide-ranging report, um, and the recommendations are to note that the new Education Scotland Bill was introduced to the Scottish Parliament, to note the Council's initial responses to the Bill, and to note that the Council will continue to engage with the consultation um, through direct responses to Scottish Government, ADIS and COSLA. Any questions? Grace is here Thank to you. answer them. Thank you. Councillor Constable. Thank you, <coughs> Provost. Uh, yes, uh, next report on this uh, Education Scotland Bill. The key item of this is the uh, need to address the inequalities of it. Uh, we have the IGB going to hopefully going to address health inequalities, which we are very much aware of across the counties. But we do have these attainment outcome <coughs> inequalities, and several of us uh, were at a COSLA conference recently, uh, <coughs> which had outlined several strategies occupied uh, and carried out by other authorities on this. Uh, this is uh, very important and something we should be taking great by. But it's a fact it is attack tackling the inequalities of attainment. And this is something which is blighting our communities in Scotland, damning the futures of many uh, children uh, where they'll be condemned just virtually by where they are born. And that must be stopped. Questions or comments? Okay. Councillor Baxter. So just pref very briefly, um, Gaelic medium education, it says uh, the bill requires all education authorities to assess the need for Gaelic medium primary education following a parental request. Does that read, as it sounds, a single parent requesting it? And if so, what kind of level of demand have we seen in Midlothian? Um, we would follow the pupil placement um, criteria for that and at the minute we have um, five primary and three secondary placements so we work together with Edinburgh for those pupils to be placed currently um, and it is something that we've been discussing with both Edinburgh and East Lothian in terms of future plans because obviously in terms of the placement of children in Gaelic schools we need to also make sure that we have enough Gaelic teachers to staff them um, as the demand may rise so it's on a pupil by pupil placement basis at present but we don't have many requests, so eight in total. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's probably something I should take up with the Scottish Parliament, but personally I would see that as Gaelic was never spoken in, in Midlothian, perhaps uh, a request for Lalans or Doric in Aberdeenshire, perhaps, but uh, I just don't see the reason why we as a council should be spending taxpayers' money on a demand for something that has no historical roots in our area. I'm not sure if you're I'm not sure if you're uh, correct on that one, but anyway, all about you. 
Thanks a lot. No, just on that point, I mean, surely more is always better than less. I mean, there's people in this area who speak Polish, or, and maybe their children are learning Polish. I can get by reasonably well in Italian and Russian, but it's never been spoken in this area. So obviously, you know, having a second language is, is, can only be of a, a bonus and a plus, and we shouldn't be putting that down, whatever the language is. When, you when we're in the land of milk and honey and we've got unlimited resources, that's fine. But unfortunately, moving down the road to something like that, cost resources that are taken away from elsewhere, Councillor Constable is 100 per cent right. The main priority there is, is tackling the disadvantaged areas, and, and that's where the money should be spent. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Move to item 12. Sorry. 11. Sorry. Try to get finished early again. <laughs> the implementation of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. A report by Mrs. Smith. You'll be glad I came back my holidays, eh? Um, the purpose of this report is to provide elected members with an update on where Midlothian Council is in relation to the implementation of the Children and Young Persons Act. So, Section um, 3.1 um, outlines where we are in relation to um, 600 hours for three and four year olds and mm. our previously named entitled two year olds. Um, plus, we are looking at an increase of approximately another 100 young people in the current year. Um, it, it's notable that um, a report to um, the Scottish, a report from the Scottish Government, reiterated its commitment to further increasing the number of free early, year, early learning and childcare to all three and four-year-olds uh, to 1,140 hours by 2020. So this will put a significant increase uh, in terms of resources, in terms of space for these young people, and whatnot as we move forward. Um, section 3.2 outlines our free school meals provision uh, in Midlothian and it shows that 89% of pupils are currently taking up their entitlement and interestingly some schools where they're not taking up their entitlement is schools where you would think that the youngsters would actually require the free school meals so we will be following that up. The Getting It Right for Every Child um, coming into force in August 2016 um, ensures um, we are looking at how we uh, implement the named person. Um, the local authority will take over from five until the, the ch child's 18 to put in place a single planning pro process and a definition of well-being. So children's rights and children's service planning, again, that links with the education bill earlier on. Um, so again, um, a requirement by the local authority to do that. And the biggest provision um, that, that's come in since April is uh, the provision for those in care and care leavers, where we'll now be required um, to, youngsters will be required, well, will be entitled to stay in care up to the age of 21, um, and they can ask for advice up to the age of 25. Um, the Scotland's adoption register would be put on the statutory footing. Um, that has implications for us in terms of our corporate parenting responsibilities, so we, we need to be looking at that. Um, and then the recommendation is really just to note the successful implication, implementation of the free, free school meals and the early years childcare provision, to note the continued work of the Council and its partners to implement the remaining provisions of the Act and request a further report prior to the end of 2015-16, giving updates on the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Constable. Uh, thank you. Uh, one thing I want to emphasise in this one is uh, I want to congratulate all our officials. How much Midlothian has been ahead of the game and other councils all over Scotland. They come across the coast at various moments of the uh, situation, but we have been very much ahead. It's been very difficult uh, to and identify all the entitled two-year-olds, uh, with DWP being in a separate government. Uh, <laughs> this has caused problems there. The free school meals uh, were never the challenge uh, 
in Midlothian, as they were in some other authorities, due to the quality of our school meals and having the very high take up we had already. <coughs> it's sorry to hear that maybe somewhere where they are needed, they aren't to be taken up. I'm, I'm glad that's going to be looked into. Uh, another point to really welcome is uh, something that can, it's this continuation of people in care that it doesn't stop at 18. Uh, the old days of a child 16 get thrown out the door, it's now someone else's problem. Uh, no, it's nice, good to see that the greatest term from 18 and 21 and right up to uh, 25. Uh, too often, I think, it has been a UK thing, children are thrown out and neglected then. Uh, one case that always amused me was the 42-year-old Italian gentleman who his mother threw him out the house and changed the locks and was compelled by law to redo it. She was responsible for him all the time. That was, doesn't quite apply here, but uh, we should be uh, people... And good to see care coming up at least to 25, if it's wanted. If the children or the young person will actually engage with the system where it's needed. But that's another good point to uh, mention. So, all in all, excellent. Happy to move the recommendation. Councillor Pottinger. Yeah, just, just on a uh, more sort of general uh, kind of, uh, issue. Um, it's, it's good to see on, on page 115, under the item 3.13, the, the EQIAs are now a link in our agenda. The, the quality impact assessments and the many things we're talking about in our qualities is, is, is more and more relevant all the time, you know, on many uh, policy papers. So I could have mentioned this on, on just about any of them. But I think you'd be remiss of me to say that we, didn't, you know, that we, we actually welcome uh, the shift that we see in the way the agendas uh, that's ensured that we're covering our qualities in all of the day's reports by providing links off to the individual EQIAs. This allows us, you know, as an organisation, to demonstrate we are considering all the quality impacts as a matter of our uh, business. And uh, I welcome it. And Ian's nodding there for an environmental agenda as well. You know, we're not following the agenda with all these papers as well. Councillor Muirhead. Yeah, I'd, I'd just congratulate officers on, um, you know, this report and getting to this point in terms of implementation, implementation of, the, of the Young People's Scotland Act. Um, you know, welcome you know, everything in that in terms of the, the 600 uh, hours and the, the raising of that to the 1140. I, I know from discussions in the regular briefings with, with officers the difficulties that have arisen that they've managed to overcome to implement the 600 hours. Uh, and I'm not trying to be negative, but I, you know, it must be concerning to all of us about you know, the implementation of 1140 uh, hours. That's, that's going to take a lot more work and be much more difficult to implement <coughs> on the basis of physical locations for, 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 the, for, for, for the, the, the provision of this, of this service. So, you know, it, it'll be a great thing. It'll be a challenge in terms of, of the implementing it for certain. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Happy to note the report. Item number 12, Shawfair Learning Community, a report by Mrs Smith, the Mrs Smith Show. Are we there yet? <laughs> Um, this is in response to an elected member um, some time ago who said, is Shawfair going to be like on Dr Shivago and you open the train doors and there's going to be nothing there? Um, and no, it's not. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek approval from the council to establish a learning community at the heart of Shawfair development. It's also a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build a new town where education and community facilities are integral to the design of the new Shawfair community. We'll never get this opportunity again. So section two outlines a background to this proposal and the research carried out to date. And section 2.1 outlines what a learning community could comprise of. Um, and section 3.1 outlines the resource implications and section five um, outlines the recommendations. Um, so our recommendations uh, that we're looking for the Council to approve is the establishment of a 0 to 18 years learning community at Shawfair. Um, for the officers to bring forward a report, um, a future report detailing the options, costs and budgetary implications of the delivery of education 
and a seminar to be called for elected members prior to the next report, as no noted in recommend recommendation two above. Thank you. Councillor Constable. Thank you. Uh, yes, another report from Mary. She must have been busy while sitting in the sun. Uh, the, I notice it's not to 18, but three to 18 schools uh, have been implemented, have brought in by eight local authorities in Scotland from Highland down to Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and the, where you're starting, as we are in Shaw here, where it's not quite like the Hope Land up to Chivalgo, where the, the, the <laughs> snow covered scene all over uh, Shaw here, but never mind. Uh, it is a blank canvas, and uh, the Director of Education in one of the counties said, uh, it is, uh, what did she say, I've got it here. Uh, but when you're starting with a blank canvas, a th 3 to 18 school makes a lot of sense. It also makes sense in the terms of the curriculum for excellence, uh, with the transition uh, between primary and secondary, and the broad education carrying on up to S3, and not just stopping at primary seven. It's a big uh, help in that respect. Uh, also, primary pupils, where you are in a big campus like that, will have access to secondary specialists, which will make a big help. And vice versa, primary help can be carried on to children even in their later years where that's needed. So uh, it's going to be very exciting uh, development. Uh, Shafi, it will be a bit in the future, but we look forward to the reports as they come. Councillor Muirhead. Yeah. Um I mean, I welcome the report as well, and I'm no, not going to oppose anything. The only point I would make that, you know, we're being asked there to um, approve the establishment of a 0 to 18 learning community at Shofia, and then the third um, uh, uh, recommendation is a seminar to be called. I, I would have been more comfortable had the seminar been called before we make that decision. I'm, I'm quite happy to sort of, in principle, make a decision. I just feel that it would have been helpful. I mean, I, I, I can't, off, off the top of my head, think of anything particularly negative about zero to, to 18 schools. But it would have been, I think it would have been helpful to even just explore any potential of that, just, just at a seminar, prior to us actually making a, a decision to go ahead and do it. Um, as I say, I've, I've not had anybody, you know, people are generally supportive of it and anything I've read. In, in the circumstances we are at is here, as we say, where we're starting with a blank canvas, it seems like a good idea. I, I just felt it was a wee bit cut before the horse there, and it would have been helpful if we'd had a, the seminar before we were asked to make a decision to go ahead on that basis. Any other comments or questions? Mr Bone. Thank you, Provost. Again, this is uh, blue sky thinking here, and I think it's a really fascinating paper, and uh, I hope we can bring it to fruition because it's got a heck of a lot of educational things going for it. So I really do welcome it. I would ask perhaps the education team, and I have raised this privately on a number of occasions with them, to perhaps revisit the idea of simply increasing the size of St. David's Primary. Um, a, this will be costly, uh, very disruptive to St. David's Primary, and B, it's going to mean that the Catholic youngsters in Chauffeur are being excluded from the community. Now, I'm always somebody who feels very strongly, although we have a separate system for Catholic schools and non-denominational schools, that I want youngsters to come as close together as possible. These, this is an enormous, effective new town, and we're going to say to the Catholic youngsters who choose to go to St. David's Primary, if that's the proposal here, you're going to have to get on a bus each morning and travel all the way, and it's a long distance through some quite difficult traffic. Um, I just don't think educationally, and I also wonder cost-wise, to be quite honest, if it wouldn't be cheaper. We're, we're saying within this section we've got two primary schools. Well, why not make one of those primary schools a joint campus and have the Catholics and everybody staying within the one community and not effectively asking the Shawfair youngsters to move to the Dalkeith community because that is how it will be perceived. I would simply ask that some further thought be given to this you know, and the seminar will be a useful vehicle for that. Thanks, Provost. Councillor Constable. I'm sure some thought will be given to all these points. Yeah, we're noting the comments made uh, do we approve the report? Thank you.
Item number 13, National Inquiry into Historical Child Abuse. Oh, a change of scenery here. A report by Mrs Trinette, Head of Children's Services. Thank you, Provost. This report is submitted to ensure that elected members are aware of the National Historical Child Abuse Inquiry, which will commence in October 2015. The overall aim and purpose of this inquiry is to raise public awareness of the historical abuse of children and young people in care and make recommendations to the Scottish Government. 2.1 outlines the background to the inquiry and the terms of reference which are listed below. 3.1 makes reference to the resources that may or may not be required at this moment. We are unsure as to uh, how the inquiry will be taken forward and if there are actual any uh, allegations that come to Midlothian itself. 3.2 highlights the, the risk um, in relation to supporting this, which I'm sure everyone agrees with, but also the reputational damage that could come with any um, historical child abuse claims made, with, made within Midlothian um, at that time. So the, the recommendation is for Council to uh, note the contents of the report and be aware of the potential impact that could have upon the Council should um, any reports of child abuse be reported from any carers or within any Midlothian resources going forward. Any questions? Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Excuse me, I have no questions, but um, I, I just think it's really important we recognise that, um, the, how dire it is for historical child abuse to have been going on. And, and recently we hear in the news that more and more of it is being reported. And uh, we have to acknowledge that um, this council will support folk who have been in these situations and will try to make sure um, that any allegations coming forward will be treated uh, respectfully and that we have the resources in place um, to help uh, these people who have suffered this abuse and that we can deal with the information appropriately. Any questions or comments? Okay, happy to accept the report. Thank you. Item number 14, a request for funding for collection of Pennycook Business Improvement District levy. A report by Mrs Smith. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've been busy over the summer. Uh, the purpose of this report uh, uh, is to request the Council to allocate up to £37,000 over five years to cover the costs of collecting the levy from the local businesses which comprise the Pennycook Business Improvement District. Um, section 2.1 outlines the background um, and it's been agreed at Cabinet. Um, section uh, Four outlines a resource requirement of 37k with over a five-year period, but 20,000 required in the financial year. And section five um, gives the recommendations. It's recommended that the council approves the budget allocation of a total of 37,000 over the period of five years, but 20,000 to be identified as a supply estimate for this financial year. Um, my colleague. Um, John Beveridge was going to be here today to answer any questions that you may have. I will try my best if you have any questions, but I may have to take anything away. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rosie. Right, thanks, Provost. Um, yeah, the, the, the Pennycook Business Improvement District, um, it's, at the moment, it's early days, but it has uh, proven a success so far. Um, we had a very successful vote uh, on it, which wasn't just close. I mean, it, it was a lot better than... I, th I think we, we could have hoped for, uh, as you can see at section 3.1. Um, the, the thing is now we've got to invest in this to, to make it a success. We've, invest, we've got a record in the Council of investing in our communities and, and trying to improve the area. And this one, certainly, the, the first two projects we've had, on, or the business improvement districts had, is uh, on the... Uh, market is one of them which has proved to be very successful it's helping increase footfall in the shops actually the local businesses are all quite happy with it the stallholders that are coming are very happy with the response they're getting many of them are running out of food uh, in fact the first one like uh, three of the stores run out, run out of food within the first first hour 
which was a bit of a disappointment to me because one of them was the pie stall. Um, <laughs> so uh, the bread one ran out and, and all. I had to get fresh supplies in. So it's, it's proven very good. And it, the main purpose of it was to increase the, increase the footfall into the shops locally. And that's what's happening. And some of them are actually writing to the, the coordinator uh, of the project, uh, Eddie L Edward Linton Smith, and, and thanking him, uh, thanking the Residence Improvement District for what is done with the market. So it is proven successful, and I think the 37,000, unfortunately, we'd rather not have this, but Edinburgh Council collect our non-domestic rates uh, anyway, and, and they're set up to uh, collect the money on behalf of the council, and um, we're having to go ahead with this. But I think 37,000 over the five years, um, it, it's not too bad an investment for this council. And I, I would uh, propose the recommendations uh, that, that we approve. Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Provost. This has been uh, very successful over other towns in Scotland, and if this one continues to go the way it's going, then uh, Dalkeith would be next, and then the Bush, and um, I will look forward to doing that. Councillor Emery. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Just a couple of questions to the Director, which uh, you, know, you better take legal advice on. No, that's not true. Um, just a little bit disappointed that uh, you get hit with a £37,000 bill by, by Edinburgh Council and really the justification, uh, you know, I mean, there isn't anything in here to justify it. I know that our own revenue section have said quite categorically, we couldn't do it, you know, we're not geared up for that. And as uh, Councillor Rosie said already, since 1996, a local government reorganisation came into being, we have gone to Edinburgh for the non-domestic side of that to be to, to be collected by them. But I just find it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of money for, uh, for a service that's not going to be much different from what they're doing at the moment. All they're going to be doing is taking a, a share of the, the rates above uh, what, what the rateable value is to, to collect. So that's my first point, maybe. You know, I, don't, I don't know what has been done or if anything else can be done at, uh, at directorate level or indeed even at chief executive level to see if we can get that, that cost down. The second thing is, is how, much do we, how much do we take in, director, on a year-to-year -year basis for the, the bids project from, from the various uh, businesses? Because clearly that, that gives you the, the catalyst for, for, for going out and trying to draw down other, other money. So it's about trying to find out how much, how much we get, because at the end of the day, if, we, if we're having to put £37,000 in, into the pot, so to speak, because ain't, we ain't going to go back to the, to the retailers or the shop owners and ask them for that money, it would be interesting to know how much we're actually going to get for Edinburgh carrying out that, that function. If you don't have the figures there today, you could perhaps get it included in the, in, in the, the minutes of, of the council meeting, and that might suffice. But I do think... You know, as a council, we need to know, is it, is it value for money in the sense of the, what Edinburgh is going to charge us? Councillor Rosie. Um, I don't know if uh, the figures are there. Are they from the proposal that went in? I think, I think you, you've got that, mate. That's fine. That's, that's the one. Should, that, that, that is just a projection because the, that was a proposal, and it's up to now the actual the, the board that's been set up. There's now a board of directors and they will then make the actual decision. It might be slightly different now, but that will be fairly close, I think, Russell, to give you that. Um, it, from what I'm reading here, um, in year one, the income from um, the people involved in the bids, it would be 31,500. Uh, and uh, in total, uh, by year five, it's 157,000 that we would bring in. So it's, it's about 31,450 uh, each year incrementally. So um, we are getting money back on it. And then Midlothian um, has a reducing amount that puts in money the first year and then it reduces year on year. Just point, I mean, can we, either yourself, director, or indeed through the chief executive of good offices, go and just really ask Edinburgh why they need to charge us 37 grand? Because I do think... To my mind, given that our systems are set up, it's only a tweak to the system and it, doesn't seem, it seems to be an inordinate amount of money for what they're having to do. It's not as if there's thousands and thousands of businesses. We're talking about a small, 
number of businesses. And I do think, you know, in best value terms, a council charging us another council, and when it is public money after all, I do think, you know, if, if you could take that one forward, I think I'd appreciate it. Councillor Rosie. I think j just on that, uh, for uh, Councillor Rimney, I, I think I mean, the Business Improvement District and along with John Beveridge, uh, and that was involved, and they looked at other ways of bringing someone else in to do it, and that was going to be even costlier to, to bring somebody afresh from the private just to do it. And, and I think Edinburgh knew they had us, <laughs> um, <laughs> shall, we, <laughs> shall we say. But yeah. Um. Okay, if I could uh, charge the Chief Executive by uh, pursuing that, um, do we agree to the, the budget? Okay, thank you. Item number 15, Parking in Midlothian, report by Ricky Moffat. Thanks, uh, Provost. Council will be aware that um, in terms of the traffic warden scheme in Midlothian and indeed across Scotland, that was uh, indicated that it would be withdrawn by Police Scotland back in 2014. Members will recall the seminar in May of this year um, and this report details options that are available to the Council to address the future enforcement of road traffic regulations. In section two in the background, um, I've uh, highlighted there the current arrangement, which is that we uh, within this council contribute to the one traffic warden, uh, and that's been in place for uh, just over 12 months now. And that was um, as a subject to direct negotiations between ourselves and Police Scotland. Now, that agreement was subsequently uh, extended for a period uh, from April this year to allow the Council to explore uh, the feasibility and other options for decriminalised parking. Uh, and as I've outlined there, the agreement is due to expire in March of next year. In, the, in discussions with Police Scotland uh, to date, um, not necessarily sure that they're exhausted, um, it's considered that it's unlikely that a further extension would um, or could be negotiated with Police Scotland beyond March of next year. Given the, the problems that have been encountered, and I'm sure members will be aware of them in their own um, council areas, uh, that it's considered that the lack of enforcement is not a sustainable position going forward, um, and indeed that then determines that we need to look at something um, beyond March 2016. I've highlighted an appendix uh, to this report where a number of local authorities are in relation to decriminalised parking, and those are the ones that have actually responded. And if you look at that in detail, you'll note that those uh, authorities that have positively taken decriminalised parking are the ones where there is a business case, where they've got a level of income that supports decriminalised parking. The vast majority of the others, where that's not the case, um, they're in pretty much a similar position to ourselves um, in Midlothian. I highlight across the page um, in the studies that were previously undertaken by both Cestran and COSLA, um, and it's just to highlight that it's very likely there would be a cost to decriminalise parking within this authority. In terms of 2.2, uh, I've highlighted there the various stages that are required to go into uh, to allow us to um, undertake decriminalised uh, parking. And in section 2.3, uh, I've given indicative time frames. One uh, is an example that's come from Dumfries and Galloway, the work that they've done and the time frame, um, and that's between two and three years. In preliminary discussions that we've had with Transport Scotland, um, and I've outlined there the various stages that they envisage require to be gone through, uh, is suggested that the time frame is somewhere approaching 18 months. Again, if I refer to the appendix, there's a kind of difference of opinion, but it's certainly in the order of 18 months to two years. Under section 2.4, I've highlighted the cost both of taking decriminalised decriminalise parking forward, um, and we've estimated that cost of approximately 150,000. The second part, which is the annual cost of running a scheme, 
Um, less um, kind of precise on that, and that's because as part of the feasibility, we would need to see where the charges that we could introduce could come in and what that impact would have on the, the actual cost. So that there potentially is a, a, an income uh, level there that could be raised. In the resource section, uh, the work that would be required would be undertaken over the, the two calendar years. So can I move into the, the recommendations? Councils uh, recommended to agree to continue the existing traffic warden service up until March 2016 and approve the supplementary estimate to allow that to take place. Agree that decriminalised parking offers the most effective parking enforcement regime in the long term. Instruct the Director of Resources to write to Police Scotland seeking to, uh, a continuation of the traffic warden service because I have outlined already that it is unlikely to be in place by March next year. Agree that the uh, audit of traffic regulation orders feasibility study preparation of the outline business case be progressed and approve the supplementary estimates as outlined. Request the director to provide a further report to council when the outcome of the feasibility and outline business case are available and also to instruct the director to look at options to reduce the time scales if possible. Uh, that will involve the discussions as I have already suggested uh, with Transport Scotland prior to introducing a decriminalised uh, parking across Midlothian. Thank you. Councillor Rosie. Thanks, uh, thanks Ricky, uh, for the report. Um, I think most of his members, and certainly in Dalkeith and Pennycook, know in the centre, town centres, uh, there are a lot of issues. And it, certainly I know it's affecting businesses in Pennycook um, uh, from what the business owners are telling me, and I can see for myself. And I, and I know that the Dalkeith members have all voiced concerns about what's happening here in the town. And there's also issues, I think, throughout Midlothian around schools and saying that's a big problem that we have. And, and I think, yes, it, it's a bit of money, but I think the alternative here is we do nothing, like some councils seem to be doing. Uh, that's it. Or we, we've got to maybe bite the bullet with this one and, and go with it. And I think at the seminar, we all um, sort of seem to come to that conclusion. But, but, but I would move that, that, that we accept the recommendations at six. And, and certainly, as I say, in, in, in 6.6 six, six is the one that we try and progress it as quick as we can, because from March next year, <coughs> we're going to have no traffic con uh, controls whatsoever. And apart from the police tell us they, they will act if it's on a double yellow line in a dangerous place, but <laughs> then that's down to what their, decision, their choice is of what's a dangerous place. So, yeah, I would move with accept. Councillor Milligan. Yeah, Provost, totally agree with what, what Councillor Rosie says. There is a problem throughout the whole of Midlothian. Um, as a frequent bus user, you quite often see disabled people, people with buggies and that, having to struggle to get on to, to, to buses because uh, um, half daft and lazy people simply park their cars wherever they want. And that's been the same since this was abandoned. But the reality here is, Nanny, I said anything around this table, what a good in the road, a, a privatised um, traffic warden service. We're being forced here because Police Scotland simply um, abandoned that, that their duties and responsibilities, as we thought they would do when they became a national force. They didn't bother at all what the, the, the public or, or councils thought and just simply walked away from it and said, Tig, here it's yours. We're also very much aware that for, for us to get the kind of money back in, uh, um, to break even here would require thousands of tickets to be issued a, a, a year in a collection regime. Um, I've heard Derek's quite right to talk about the problems around schools and stuff like this. It really means that we need to do that audit to see what restrictions and stuff like that, and because most of the areas around the schools are, are, are housing estates and stuff like that where it, it would be very difficult to put any parking restrictions in, so it's going to be difficult to see how to do that. This is the only way we've got to dealing with this. But let's be dead clear about it. It's not the way that I want to go. It's not the way the Labour group that want to go. And I can't imagine it's the way that most elected members around this table want to be, and that's a privatised uh, um, uh, um, traffic warden service. Um, it's absolutely um, critical, though, that we get something done about what's happening in our town centres and areas like that, where folk are just abandoning cars when they know police cars are just going to drive past them with any kidology that Police Scotland are doing anything about it is just that. Councillor Brent, did you worry? Uh, most of the, uh, what I was going to say has been said, but I had thought I'd seen everything in Dalkeith, uh, double parking on both sides of St Andrews Street and double parking in, in bus base. It's just incredible. 
Okay. Um, I'd like to remind our Labour colleagues that there's still two places on the Safer Communities Board for them to come along and criticise the police any time they want. And I'd be happy to approve the recommendations. Thank you. I can now ask members of the public to uh, leave the chambers, please.